Good evening, guys um, and girls. Um, well, first of all, I want to say thanks to CAST for organising this meetup and organising the facilities, etc. So this has been uh, great, and uh, I'm uh, glad to meet a few of you beforehand and hope to meet more of you uh, uh, later. Um, CAST obviously is involved very high up in the stack, uh, managing the data of many, many clusters, and that's a very valuable function. We are right at the opposite end. Uh, we're focused on the infrastructure for building the clusters um, that uh, uh, applications uh, or environments like CAST provide. So we're the other end of the, uh, other end of the scale. Um, what I wanted to talk tonight about was um, effectively the options for building those clusters for whatever applications that you're trying to build. Um, that's bare metal, generally some sort of cloud infrastructure, or most people use AWS. And then what we're introducing, which is a new concept called clusters as a service. So I want to describe what we're uh, trying to do and get feedback from you. Um, just background on the company. Uh, KDF Data is a fairly young company. We started in 2014, uh, so we're now about three years old. We spent a year and a half developing, another six months testing, and last year we started shipping uh, our products and services. So uh, we were early in the uh, deployment phase. Uh, very keen to talk to uh, uh, customers and, uh, uh, and people who might use our stuff. And this is really effectively our first introduction to the general audience. We've been mostly focusing on one-to-one -one relationships with uh, customers until now. Uh, myself, um, from a background point of view, uh, this is my fourth company in Silicon Valley. Um, I spent most of my career at Cisco, building uh, high-end routing infrastructure and MPLS. Uh, then spent uh, a couple of years doing uh, memory technologies to switch to routers. And then eight years with Violent Memory, which is the first flash memory uh, array vendor. And uh, we went uh, public a few years ago. I've just seen after we went public. And then for the last few years, we've been uh, uh, working on Kodak and building uh, its uh, software solution out. So the whole, what's the problem that we're um, focused on? What problem do we think uh, exists out there? Um, what we're seeing is a huge explosion in the amount of uh, big data software out there in terms of the various uh, uh, solutions that you guys are generally working on, whether it's analytics software, orchestration software like Kubernetes and Mesos, uh, the various distribution softwares, lots of data sets of various types, uh, NoSQL databases, the CouchDBs, MemSQLs, as well as the do Cassandra, etc., and a lot of application logic that has been uh, put together for custom applications. All of that software effectively has to go through multiple phases to get really deployed in large-scale systems. You really go through dev, test, you often have a pilot, and then you have production. All of those systems need various types of infrastructure, and there are many different ways that people want to deploy those uh, solutions, whether it's hosted in a colo, sorry, in a private data center, or, or um, a managed cloud service. So that problem is causing a lot of delays in the whole development process of big data applications, especially as they're becoming more real-time and more complex, which has been the trend for the last few years. So when you look at the, the challenges, um, it's a very complex problem that the operations people have to solve in terms of helping deploy large-scale applications. How many clusters and stacks are required? Uh, the record we found so far is 15 stacks in one application. Right? Um, so it's 15 sets of infrastructure uh, to build one application, which is a mix of real-time batch analytics applications. Uh, for each cluster, how many servers are needed? Uh, do you need 100 nodes in a new cluster? Do you need 200 nodes? Do you need 1,000 nodes? Or do you need 10 nodes? It's a very hard problem to solve and uh, something which uh, uh, people uh, have to spend a lot of time planning on. What's the CPU and RAM configuration for each of the stacks? How much disk capacity you need? All of those details that you need to solve and you need to get right, especially if you're buying uh, physical hardware and bare metal uh, systems. So that's the technical problem. On the business side, uh, I'm sure a lot of your uh, employers or companies that you've started have to effectively deploy these clusters. They have to deploy effectively double test and production clusters. And you have to work out the sizes for each, how you make sure that the quality of the software is good and you've tested it across. You've got to work out how the cluster is going to grow with time. It's a very hard problem, especially to start up in the Silicon Valley. It could be you know, it grows very quickly, or it could be that it grows more, more, more modestly. How do you plan for that? Um, budgets. Everyone has problems with budgets. When you first tell the CFO, this is what I need, he says, what? Well, <laughs> you need to find a cheaper solution. So managing that problem of uh, CapEx and OpEx is a, is a difficult issue. And uh, uh, it's
it's often very hard to predict what the uh, use case is very cluster is going to be. What you find is once you've got data in systems and you start to use it, then suddenly people think of new ideas for those uh, for that data, and suddenly you've got more users and more workloads and more performance issues uh, on the clusters that you have to build. So lots of problems, and uh, one of the uh, uh, so and effectively those problems exist whether you've got a small company uh, that's starting out or a larger company that has many many applications. So we tend to think about it from a, a problem space point of view as sort of two larger classes of customers. You have the startups building some sort of analytics service or machine learning uh, uh, capability, and the goal is to build a product that um, uh, the world will use. And uh, these days it's usually a mix of real-time batch uh, applications or analytics, uh, lots of data sets and many data sets and customers. Um, the data sets start off small, but they grow over time. You've got a plan for that, so you've got to choose the right technology and the right type of cluster model uh, for those data sets. Performance requirements change rapidly. Um, you've got multiple stacks, uh, Hadoop, uh, Kafka, Druid, etc., um, and Cassandra in particular, are uh, commonly used. What we tend to find for those small customers is it's generally five to ten clusters are needed, and it's a small budget from the point of view of what you've got for CapEx particularly, and you want to grow the business. And time to start is critical. How do you get those clusters up and going? So that's the sort of the first class of customer. And then the second class is the more established company, um, a mid-sized company, or even in some cases large enterprise. I spoke to a gentleman earlier that's from Apple, so they're the extreme end of the problem space. Um, they have uh, a lot of the same real-time batch analytics, but they have large numbers of very large data sets. Um, so that's a, a very significant problem for them. Increasing performance requirements, they have large development and um, uh, data science teams. So they need a lot of experimental clusters um, and a lot of development clusters rather than just one uh, big production cluster. Um, so what we find is for those larger companies that typically when you look at their whole problem space and look at all the departments that are uh, within those companies, they often need 20 to 100 different clusters of different sizes. And that number is changing all the time. These clusters often get built for three to six months. They're used to test or try something. It may or may not work. If it doesn't work, that cluster will get torn down and you've got to be able to uh, um, start again and reuse, it, reuse infrastructure for other um, applications. So for those larger companies, it's, they've got large budgets, but what they're looking for is more cost efficiency and still deliver the applications, and they've got to support many of these uh, various applications. So what are people choosing from? Um, typically today, uh, I'd say most of the large applications are built on bare metal, so it's dedicated cluster hardware. Every hardware is a set of servers. That number of servers can range from 20 to uh, many hundreds, and couple of cases of thousands of servers. It's high performance, it can scale out, but it's very high capex. Typically, uh, uh, we're talking uh, uh, the order of a few hundred thousand dollars per rack of equipment that is being provided. Um, the other solution which most startups tend to use these days is AWS, and typically it's using a mix of EC2, EBS, and S3. Um, what we tend to find when you try and deploy that way is it is lower performance than the bare metal solutions. Uh, you end up with more nodes than this uh, to get the performance scale. But what you don't have is OPEX, uh, op CAPEX, sorry. You have no CAPEX, high OPEX, a monthly uh, bill. So it's a pay per month uh, model. Um, what's interesting is that what people often want to do is develop an AWS and then deploy it on their metal. And uh, what we find is when you talk to people who try that, it's quite a complex process. The development tools that you use to build those AWS clusters are very different from what you use to deploy on their metal. So that is a challenging uh, problem in today's environment. So if we look at bare metal, um, a few years ago, so five, six years ago, <coughs> when you talk to people doing big data uh, clusters, it wasn't a big problem doing bare metal. You tended to find there was mostly Hadoop applications, it was mostly a, a few name nodes, and then a lot of data nodes, and so you ended up with effectively two types of servers that you deploy in the, the typical environment. Um, 
Today what we're finding is a lot more real-time stuff being mixed with the batch analytics stuff. And most people building clusters end up with different stacks uh, for each of the different functions they provide. And so you end up with many, many server types that you have to deploy in your bare metal applications. So uh, um, each effectively node needs a specific mix if you want to optimize the CPU RAM to size networking bandwidth. Um, and so it's a fairly uh, complex decision to decide, to decide which service to deploy for each stack. Um, you do tend to find that efficiency is poor because effectively you'll oversize some clusters, undersize others, and hence you end up being limited by whatever that other uh, cluster is. Uh, one common problem we're seeing is that um, people will have multiple to do clusters, and uh, one of the larger customers we've been dealing with had three of them. And what they would say is only one to do cluster was ever busy at any one time. So the other two uh, clusters, which were effectively large amounts of resources, were pretty idle and they would never actually get all three of them being used uh, at the same time. But logistically, they found it very hard to uh, consolidate those clusters into one cluster. So um, um, we're also finding, um, in general, with customers that have been deploying these things for three to uh, four years, that those clusters change continuously you know, the software that they're being used. Uh, changes a lot, the requirements on the clusters change a lot, and uh, um, it's hard to uh, change the physical configuration of the servers once you deploy them. So it's a... The other approach is AWS. Um, so AWS was started around uh, 2006 in terms of people really starting to use it, and uh, it was really the first version of the cloud, become a lot more popular, um, and there's a lot, a lot of it which is very good. Um, it's really the largest and most mature public cloud. It's a very wide range of use of services. You can basically pick any machine um, and deploy uh, virtually any application given all the support they've done for software. All you need is a credit card, it's great, and pricing by the hour is fantastic. You know, it makes it addictive, you can get started. The low cost from the development point of view is great. Uh, we use it internally ourselves as a developing platform. Um, how about what we found when we looked at customers and what they, um, they're doing in their experiences is that really from a big data point of view, AWS has a lot of limitations. Um, it was really designed around instance type architecture and web, uh, web uh, requirements, person to machine interactions. It wasn't designed around uh, uh, clusters and machine to be machine communications. Um, in general, lots of fixed instances, you have to choose which one it is. But they're very fixed in terms of the amount of CPU, RAM, disk, etc. Not very configurable uh, from the point of view of the, uh, uh, configuring the big data nodes. Provisioning, a few good options, but it's quite complex. If you want modest cost, then you want to use spot pricing. Using spot pricing for big data nodes is almost impossible. Right? Uh, you really need to be able to have more consistent uh, uh, nodes and, uh, and data. Um, but probably the biggest issue we found in terms of getting performance out of the um, Amazon or AWS is the bandwidths. The, the no bandwidths aren't very high. If you ever use a small instance with only a few vCPU and a little bit of RAM, you're only getting one to maybe two gig of bandwidth. If you want 10 gig of bandwidth, you've got to buy uh, instances with a lot of CPU and a lot of RAM, much more expensive. But that's the only way to scale a uh, high performance uh, application. So when you look at all the instances, and generally I find ec2instances.info is better than Amazon <laughs> for working out what to go use. There's a huge number of them, lots of complex names um, and uh, descriptions of them. Each of them has a particular vCPU, RAM um, and network um, uh, configuration. And that network configuration, you'll find a lot of the instances are effectively low, moderate, etc. Those nodes, unless you're just developing and you don't really have any real data, are generally too slow to run any of the big data apps uh, that you might run. So you, you end up being limited to the 10 gig uh, nodes, which are generally fairly expensive. Um, you need that bandwidth for both um, node to node communication within the Zoom or Spark, etc. But you also need it for the bandwidth to the storage, particularly for EBS and also to uh, S3. Um, the nodes have, have uh, instant storage, but Amazon is 
moving away from that, they're effectively uh, making more nodes without storage and uh, using the S your storage. Um, one of the challenges with the instance storage is if you define your instances for a certain size and you put data on those uh, uh, instance storage nodes, if you want to change the size, it's really open because then you've lost your data uh, relative to uh, that's tied up to that instance. So the solution generally is to use EBS for the persistent data uh, associated with the nodes. Um, that EBS generally is slower, um, higher latency, and um, is more expensive, um, but effectively that's the solution for trying to make the data persistent. So you end up with effectively large nodes and EBS as your preferred mechanism if you want to deliver a performance uh, big data cluster. So looking at that sort of choice that people have to make, um, we, um, um, we're, we're looking at this problem and saying, okay, is there another approach? And we think there potentially is, which is clusters as a service model. Um, and really it's about building clouds that are oriented towards big data and big data clusters, as opposed to oriented towards web scale applications or web applications, which are more single instance type systems. And we think the requirements of this are basically uh, it's hosted or on-prem. In other words, right now you have a choice of Amazon, which is hosted, or build your own clusters on-prem. And we think in the future what people really want is to be able, to be able to develop on an environment and then run it as a hosted environment, so that no infrastructure, or bring it in-house, run it on their own hardware, and uh, run it uh, effectively on their own premises. Um, obviously it needs to be high performance, so more performance more like bare metal, and it needs to be like a capex where required and low opex where required. So more of the choice of uh, uh, how it operates. So what we are doing um, at Kodiak is building that um, infrastructure by effectively developing a software layer, which we'll talk about in a second, which allows you to build um, an on-prem cloud or use it as a hosted cloud and deploy clusters for big data applications in other places, but also link to the public cloud as an AWS or Microsoft or Google to get access to data and to effectively use the, uh, those clouds for the things that they're very good at, which includes spin up, spin down services and uh, uh, long term uh, uh, data um, uh, storage. So that's at a high level what we're doing. Um, what it looks like internally, uh, just a sort of simplified diagram is that we take what would typically be bare metal clusters and so you, know, you might have a 40 node cluster which fits in a rack each on your server with 8 disks or whatever you take that cluster and we virtualize it either as VMs and disks or as Docker containers and disks and we run it on a shared fabric um, which uh, is based on software that we've developed the key difference um, in this fabric is it's a cluster hypervisor rather than a single um, a machine hypervisor. Um, the clusters need both the equivalent of the VM or container, but they also need disks for each of the nodes, and it needs to be shared across the pool of infrastructure. So it's a hyper-converged um, uh, uh, hypervisor. Um, VMs and containers are critical. What we tend to find today is for very persistent applications, VMs are still a bit more reliable, and so we, we're effectively using a KVM infrastructure uh, to provide VMs. Uh, for containers, effectively, we can work with um, uh, Kubernetes or standard Docker tools and build um, um, virtual clusters with uh, containers as well. And the, uh, the icon here that we uh, use is called a data container. That describes everything that you need for your virtual cluster. So that cluster can be a multi-stack cluster with the Duke, Cassandra, Kafka, etc., um, or a single stack. It describes every machine that you need um, and the networking that you need between those machines and the disks that you need for uh, uh, every uh, machine in those clusters. And then it runs on whatever infrastructure you provide and or we provide in the case of the hosted service. Uh, which is just generally x86 uh, servers with whatever networking and storage uh, you can afford. Uh, in general, what we recommend is, uh, because it's a uh, converged virtualization platform, go for high bandwidth networking. So we're generally deploying with uh, um, uh, dual 50 or 100 gig networking and uh, with high performance SSDs. So we generally perform within uh, 
through our own systems within the SSD is to get the most bang out of the system. Um, unlike other people who try to build converged platforms, the one thing that we haven't done is build a file system. So the idea of the, this converged fabric is that the user's file system, so the HDFS, etc., um, is the file system. We're providing what it looks like virtual disks to all of the clusters and providing a way of uh, virtualizing all of these uh, clusters that way. So we end up with very, very good performance. So um, what does it look like from the um, um, point of view of a, a user and thinking about how to deploy a new application? Uh, so first of all, um, we gather the cluster needs and effectively that's really just a table. It's a table which specifies types of nodes, how many nodes that you need, what your vCPU, what your RAM requirements are, what your SSD requirements are in terms of size, etc. And um, um, we, uh, we build this, this, from this table, we can effectively say, okay, that's the cluster you want. We turn that into a data container, and then that data container can be run on any infrastructure, and then effectively we can then point the uh, user to that cluster and he has uh, access to all the nodes, he can effectively deploy his Hadoop cluster, uh, Cassandra cluster, or mixed cluster um, uh, easily that way. Uh, just to give you an idea of how it scales, um, if you want a 100 node cluster with 10 disks each, which is sort of just a generally you know, pretty big, uh, uh, big data cluster, um, if you want to do that in AWS or you want to do it in OpenStack or something like that, uh, it takes 3,100 steps to create that cluster. Um, you've got to effectively create every VM, you've got to create every disk, you've got to attach every disk, you've got to format every disk. So it's a very large job that the, uh, the ops person has to go through. Um, we turn that into a five line spreadsheet that you fill in and a, uh, um, where it's turned into a data container XML description that's about 50 lines. And when we deploy all the infrastructure, it's an entire function. You either get the whole cluster or we say no, there aren't enough resources to, get, to produce that cluster. So we make it a very reliable system that um, uh, can be deployed very quickly. So it's all about treating nodes like cattle, not like pets. You don't deploy and configure every individual node. You just uh, specify all of the nodes that you want. So um, use cases. Um, some of our early customers are like this. Uh, effectively, they, uh, this particular example was a customer that was in AWS. Um, and they were deploying uh, clusters for each of their larger customers. Um, and they're using uh, um, Druid as their, um, uh, as their tool. What they found was when deploying Druid, and if you look at the Druid diagram, which is up here, each of these little squares is nodes. There's lots of different nodes that are required for a whole Druid cluster. You end up with a minimum cluster, which is about 14, 15 nodes, and then it's even bigger. You know, it scales as you want um, um, uh, more capacity and uh, uh, more performance. What they're finding is each cluster, you know, ended up costing them quite a lot. Um, it was hard to share those clusters between different customers, so they were building a cluster for each customer, and uh, uh, that was getting expensive. And they were also finding that they they tried to reduce the node sizes to reduce costs, performance was very poor. So what they found was a better solution was to use the MemCloud solution, uh, effectively deploy the clusters on MemCloud. MemCloud would still access the uh, historical data via S3, so effectively S3 was used to drag it down. And uh, the benefit was they ended up with something which is 4x faster for about half the cost because effectively the MemCloud infrastructure is all optimized around building a cluster not building a generic cloud service like AWS. Uh, from a time point of view, it's about a two-day process to effectively move the cluster from AWS to um, MemCloud and point it to S3, get all the data down, and get everything up and operating. We think we can reduce that, but that's roughly how long it uh, takes in, uh, in today's environment. Um, another example of a uh, customer working with that actually has their own infrastructure ties into the Kubernetes discussion um, that we're about to have next. Um, they're building self-driving vehicles and they have a need for large numbers of clusters to develop um, uh, effective processing petabytes of data. So they're doing development tests, machine learning, and they've got production clusters to track better real-time cars. 
So lots of clusters, lots of types, the software is boiling continuously, they don't want a fixed environment where they effectively deploy you know, 100 servers for this particular cluster and then 50 for another cluster. They want a much more dynamic environment. So they ended up with a solution of building a virtual cluster infrastructure um, where they used us for um, building virtual disks and clusters, but they used Kubernetes for doing the um, uh, compute orchestration for deploying more um, dynamic um, uh, environments. So uh, uh, we effectively built plugins for Kubernetes so it works nicely together and they get the advantage of persistent um, um, clusters that can specify easily plus the dynamic nature of Kubernetes for effectively uh, short-lived jobs. And what they end up with is a pool of resources which can be shared and allocated to any cluster that they suit. So benefit of the game, faster disks, um, even though they were using SSDs and we're using SSDs, uh, the difference is that um, no longer is one application or one node is it tied to single individual SSDs. Effectively, the data is more spread across multiple SSDs on the infrastructure. And so you end up with much more performance uh, for each of the nodes within the clusters, uh, which uh, helps uh, performance the applications. And then roughly half the cost. Um, we think it will actually be less than that, as in more savings. It's a bit like VMware in virtualizing single nodes. Uh, when you virtualize a single machine, you get effectively uh, four times the workload uh, on that machine than you otherwise would. For big data, it may not be the same as 4x, but it's certainly going to be more than 2x um, because you're getting the same uh, shared benefits. And if a cluster is idle and another cluster is busy, it's getting access to all of the computer memory uh, as needed. And uh, the other major benefit is lower IT admin costs. Um, currently, if you run, deploy bare metal clusters and do um, Cassandra, etc., if a disk fails, you have to manage it at the application level. Right. So you have to replace the disks and restart uh, um, disks and restart nodes, etc. With our model, um, when a disk fails, the application doesn't see it. We hide that um, uh, with no pr uh, protection across disks within a node. So that when we replace the disks, the application is able to see any problem. So if you've got a larger scale environment and you're uh, seeing sort of uh, uh, major operational issues, those operational issues uh, go away. And then separately, uh, they can spin up new clusters very quickly. So they can just define a new cluster, create a data, data container to uh, find that cluster, and then spin it up um, whenever they need it. So it's a much more dynamic environment. So that's a summary of what we're doing. I um, hope I get a chance to talk to some of you uh, after this, uh, this talk. Um, so we're we're trying to produce effectively an infrastructure that is designed for the big data apps that you guys are developing. Um, we think the three key um, requirements that uh, we'd love to get your feedback on are one is simplified simplification, make it very easy to provision clusters with single clicks. And so for example, a data container that is defined as a cluster, you can use it once, once you've done it, you can go and use it again and create another cluster of the same type uh, um, for the development of a test, etc. immediately. So doing those sort of things. Um, performance is always critical. Uh, no one ever has enough performance. If they do have enough performance, then someone's saying, please don't buy as much hardware. <laughs> reduce the cost and reduce the power. So the, the idea is basically improve performance without uh, requiring any additional hardware. And because of the model that we're using of sharing all the resources, what we find is we can use newer technologies. So we can use um, um, provide more RAM in machines, we can use faster SSDs, etc. But it's shared resource, so that resource is always being used. You tend to find you can move to newer technologies like using more flash without the problems that you would have if you tried to build dedicated clusters, each with their own SSDs. So uh, uh, that's the, the goal, and uh, so far we've had very good feedback from the people we have talked to. You're a new group. Love to hear what uh, uh, problems you have and, uh, and uh, see if there's any ways that we can help you with getting more infrastructure for the clusters that you're building. So, thank you very much. Questions for Marvin? Yeah. Could you comment on the security features of the main cloud? Please? Sure. So, um, effectively, the um, um, at our infrastructure level, we're providing virtual machines, 
And we can make those uh, machines encrypted in the sense that the disks, the virtual disks, are uh, encrypted themselves. But the security at the application level is handled by whatever application you're running. So if it's a Hadoop cluster or a Cassandra cluster, all of those security features are inherited without us interfering with them. But if you want a encrypted disks, we can also provide encrypted virtual disks for those clusters. Can I, can I, yep. can I, 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 can I
So like you have the Duke data nodes, the Cassandra data nodes, etc. And then we, get, we effectively provide an API which lets you create new nodes of the same type. Great. Right. Yeah. So it sort of uh, makes, it, makes it automated in terms of incremental addition to nodes. Uh, once you do that, for example, you say you're adding Hadoop nodes to a cluster, you would create that through the API and then through, say, Ambari or whatever your um, managed tool is, say, add these particular nodes into the cluster. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, how do we deal with the sizing of the scale? So, we don't solve the problem of how big a cluster should be, but what we do is we're providing tools that make it easier. Um, to add or extend or manage that size. Um, one thing we do, for example, is thin provisioning. So say you wanted a petabyte cluster, but for the first year it's only going to use 100 terabytes. Right. Um, you can actually define a cluster as a petabyte, and you can run it on 100 terabytes of servers because we thin provision everything. Um, but at some point, if you get to a petabyte, we need to provide the hardware resources. It doesn't, but you can define things in a way where you're defining for the scale and then backfilling is required um, um, as your data grows. So, uh, there's MemCloud and uh, any features which have uh, cross-cloud uh, clusters? And cross-cloud between... Uh, I mean, if, uh, let's say my Spark cluster is only AWS, and mm -hmm. maybe my slower clusters uh, are on Azure. Right. Something like that. Yeah, nothing specific that we're doing there, but um, from the MemCloud cluster, you can access Azure or AWS for S3, yeah, independently. Okay. So, uh, specify which cloud provider I want? Yeah, uh, effectively, as far as you, um, the nodes are concerned, you're just providing effectively a, uh, um, you're specifying like you would a Linux server, okay, which cloud should it access and what, you know, how does it access as S3? So you provide your own S3 keys, etc and um, access to the data network. So it just looks like another set of servers that you have access to in the configure. Okay, so appreciate the time.